thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to uh, share some thoughts uh, uh, with the panel today. Uh, just as a brief introduction, I spent uh, a number of years at, at JPL, initially on the, uh, uh, the MER operations team as a downlink analyst uh, uh, way back in the day, and then participated in the development of Athlete and its derivatives, uh, Triathlete, and uh, a number of other uh, systems. At JPL, we developed a number of different arms. You can see uh, sort of the tiny one uh, down there, uh, everywhere from uh, three or four meters long to uh, IDD replicas with uh, uh, much higher payloads for uh, future missions. At JSC, I was involved with sending a uh, Robonaut to the space station, um, and then also in developing the Centaur 2 platform and uh, the Valkyrie full humanoid for the Dark Robotics Challenge. And since then, I've been at Motive uh, developing systems both to internal and external customers uh, 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 from that, and I'll get to that uh, in a bit. Motive Space Systems, we're located in Pasadena. Uh, we're not too far from JPL. Uh, we were formed back in 2014, so only a, a, a six years old now. We do qualify as a small business, so sometimes that's important for partnering and collaborative uh, efforts with, uh, with larger organizations. Um, and uh, we're happy to be engaged in multiple spaceflight uh, uh, developments. We currently have uh, hardware on, on the ISS on its way to Mars, uh, as well as uh, systems that are slated for uh, LEO, GEO, uh, and future Mars uh, options. I wanted to take a, a little bit, uh, talk about Mars, uh, or excuse me, motive uh, in space. We envision a, uh, a space economy that's uh, increasingly responsive, resi resilient, uh, reliable, and affordable. Uh, sort of the enabling technologies uh, uh, as we move forward are uh, uh, modular architectures that are re reusable, ultimately that might be interchangeable and increasingly general purpose. Uh, we, we feel that those technologies are important to make the systems affordable uh, and realizable on increasingly uh, constrained budgets or timelines or uh, for missions that just have a lot more scope and so any single subsystem uh, can't take up a, uh, a significant fraction of the pro uh, technical programs attention or, or budgets. The enabling trends uh, uh, across the industry that will uh, uh, make that these technologies possible uh, are really sort of uh, initially I'll go with a very boring one. It's the development and implementation uh, of standards, uh, specifically for interface standards, whether those are mechanical, electrical, uh, or software interfaces. Um, if uh, if we as an industry and across uh, uh, government organizations um, can come to a set of standards uh, for this is what our, uh, th this is how, for instance, on the International Space Station, um, uh, they have the International Docking Adapter uh, uh, standard, which now Dragon, uh, uh, the Europeans, uh, and, and Orion, all are uh, docking or, or will be able to dock with the ISS with three completely different systems. Uh, that's all because a standard was published, vetted, uh, and adopted by, uh, by our organizations. Um, a second enabling trend is spacecraft as networks. So what I mean by that is both multiple, whether they're rovers or spacecraft, operating together seamlessly, uh, communicating uh, together, but also inside the spacecraft themselves where components uh, that previously might have had to be in a monolithic uh, architecture uh, a very specific communications bus or uh, an intricate way of mounting that uh, as uh, spacecraft rather than a monolithic uh, system they become uh, more and more a network of subsystems uh, that, that work together. Uh, from a robotic standpoint both of those technologies uh, or, or trends are very important and enable uh, uh, a specific technology for robotics, which is space distributed motion controller. So we can move away from a, a large monolithic control box or control system, uh, uh, large electrical harnesses, um, and instead have a lot more flexibility for the integration uh, and, 
of distributed uh, motor controllers um, that, that just sh drastically shorten the development time uh, and, and integration effort that's required to make that happen. Um, and finally, if you uh, the last trend that I want to talk about is sort of the expanded environmental envelopes, whether those are uh, uh, radiation or temperature um, uh, envelopes that as components uh, uh, increase their envelope uh, and then you couple that with distributed electronics, um, you suddenly, the integration effort goes way, way down because you have to think about uh, the, uh, the rollover impacts of a, of a small change uh, in one system then don't flow through the entire system. Uh, or the, the effort to integrate those, uh, those things are much, much smaller. So uh, that, that's my, my spiel on uh, sort of the, 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 uh, the new space economy and, and where we're gonna go. So uh, with that, I wanna talk a little bit about where Motive is coming from uh, to talk about where we're going specifically. So uh, uh, Motive is a motion control robotics uh, space uh, robotics company. Um, our flagship product, the product that launched us back in 2014, is our Alpha mo uh, Robotic Motor Controller. This is a flagship class motor controller. It's large, uh, it's, it's powerful, uh, it can source up to 100, or excuse me, one kilowatt uh, per axis. Uh, highly configurable, uh, so it can operate everything from huge motors to, to, to small ones. Um, and the operator can configure it um, to read any number of uh, uh, of sensors um, or, or uh, run different control loops. It's rated to 100 kilorads, um, so it can be in geo for 15 years or otherwise be part of uh, flagship class missions. Um, this uh, motor controller has flown. Uh, it's on the ISS as part of uh, the robotic refueling mission, as part of the cryo cooler controller, um, and then also as the fuel hole, uh, fueling holes, uh, hose real drive and the fuel pump drive. Uh, and then it, uh, 11 of these are in the, uh, slated for the NASA Restore uh, satellite servicing mission for a seven DOF uh, robotic arm and then for uh, and the, the four DOF end effector there. So this is sort of your traditional monolithic uh, uh, motor controller, highly reliable, uh, 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 suitable for missions that have a very low risk tolerance. We know how to implement systems like this. Uh, they just take um, a, a while to uh, to integrate. So the uh, uh, some of our other uh, products uh, include uh, our Bravo motor controller and our uh, and our Echo brushless DC motor controller. The Bravo controller was the first controller that we made that was specific for robotic uh, applications. So it's a little bit larger than a credit card. Um, it's also rated for 100 kilorad uh, and really it was designed to sit in a robotic arm between two joints or to drive a space mechanism uh, that was fully redundant. Uh, so we, uh, which has actually ended up where this system has been used uh, 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 in projects slated for space flight. The Echo uh, brushless uh, motor commutator, this is designed for systems that where you want, uh, where you have a, a highly restricted size, uh, weight and power. Uh, and so your centralized motor controller, uh, the interface on that is extremely simple. It makes a brushless uh, DC motor look a lot like a, a brush DC motor. So you can swap the polarity swap the, uh, change the voltage and limit the current to drive a distal system uh, uh, that would then look like a brush motor, uh, a motor on regular applications. And we've made tens of these, uh, maybe even a hundred now, uh, and are uh, uh, slated for a lot of deployment mechanisms destined for uh, uh, earth observation and, and beyond. And then of course, Motive is also involved in uh, the robotic uh, hardware itself. So for March 2020, we provided the uh, robotic arm at, uh, at the front of the vehicle. Uh, that was a development that, uh, where we developed five uh, new actuators. Those are wet lubed actuators based on a harmonic drive. They do require heaters, uh, 
but are uh, really quite capable. Uh, even though Mars 2020 was a, uh, uh, a quote unquote built to print mission, uh, the, uh, the arm had to be redesigned uh, to have 50% more payload uh, and still fit in the same uh, hole there in the, the descent vehicle. Um, and so it's, a, it's a approximately a 70 kilogram uh, robotic arm with approximately uh, 40 kilogram uh, uh, payload. Uh, so 50% more than, uh, than Curiosity. Uh, so really to get your, a sense of, of what it is, it's like a bowling ball on the end of a, of a fishing pole uh, from, from that perspective. One of the things that we're very proud of uh, uh, is that we developed a six axis uh, force torque sensor that uh, is the interface between the robotic arm and the uh, turret. And so that, uh, that force torque sensor actually has to work across a temperature range of 180 degrees C. Uh, uh, so that's, it's great. I, I believe it's the first six axis four star sensor uh, that will be on Mars. That'll enable uh, a good data collection while uh, interacting with the train when we reach out and touch things and also enable that uh, sample handling and caching uh, uh, maneuver where we uh, put samples back in the, in the rover body itself. Um, and, th and then finally, uh, this is a, sort of a, a legacy uh, robotic arm architecture. Uh, you can see with mo the motor controllers and, and all the other electronics in the rover body itself, uh, a big chunk of the design of the robotic arm is actually to handle the 1,000 uh, conductors that are terminated at the, uh, at the turret itself. So there's approximately 1,100 at the base of the arm, and then 100 of those sense and power lines um, uh, peel off at, at each of the actuators and sensors along the uh, along the arm itself. So uh, harnessing becomes a big mass driver uh, as well as a, a capability driver. Uh, so Motive is not just doing uh, uh, designing systems for uh, for space. We've also uh, uh, been doing work in the, the mobile robotics market here on Earth. Uh, we envision mobile robotics uh, as collaborative robotic systems, uh, not just able to go and sense uh, or measure uh, things on a day-to-day on -day basis, but also as an enabler to go and do, do work. And we see mobility as an enabler uh, uh, to make that happen. Uh, our hypothesis when we started out was that we could take the best practices from our collective uh, experience uh, in, in aerospace and apply that to ground robotics to come up with better and more capable systems. Um, and so we launched our robotics efforts actually by licensing uh, the RoboSimian platform originally developed at JPL. Uh, we were involved with the manufacture of that first effort, uh, the first competition robot um, uh, for the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Um, and then we're able to uh, provide that system to uh, Duke University. Uh, I think it ended up in Chris Hauser's lab uh, where he was doing uh, human scale, uh, extreme terrain uh, uh, activities. Um, initially, the picture there is of uh, a RoboSimian autonomously picking out handholds on a human scale climbing wall. Um, we learned a lot from RoboSimian and, uh, uh, and decided to take a fresh look at sort of that uh, that architecture of a limb system and, and what that would what that would mean uh, uh, for the next generation of, of systems and one of the ideas that we tried to hit was that we would make the system completely modular um, everything from the power system to the limbs to the link itself um, you can expand the battery um, uh, the, the limbs are separable and actually each link and each actuator are separable from the system uh, and can exist as, uh, uh, as a standalone robot. Um, uh, and so when you're designing a system to be a uh, mobile and modular system, uh, uh, just like in aerospace, uh, specific power and specific torque uh, become incredibly important to enable, uh, enable these systems. Uh, we've actually made uh, uh, a few of these. Uh, there's one at uh, Rutgers University doing uh, disaster response, 
And then actually the, uh, we've had some success with uh, uh, enabling the uh, constituent parts uh, to be available for purchase. Uh, uh, one of our first customers was the Toyota Research Institute where they integrated some parts of the system uh, into their, their uh, home robotics. So where does that take us into the, the future for, uh, for space? Motive is in investing in enabling technologies to lower the cost of robotics for space. Uh, and using some of those uh, mechanisms, such as internal uh, our, uh, research and development funding, as well as uh, NASA programs like SBIRs uh, and new funding opportunities, such as uh, Artemis, LSII, CLIPS, and others. Um, and uh, so we, we think that NASA uh, and space in general is in, on a good path uh, for smaller players like ourselves uh, to really uh, bring down the cost of robotics uh, in the future uh, while maintaining that reliability and rugged, uh, ruggedization. Uh, one of the things that we have recently done uh, and, and, and what we realized when making RoboMantis was that that same modular approach where originally we thought, oh, we'll make ground robots better by taking things from aerospace. Um, if we combine that modular approach with the reliability uh, that we demonstrated up with on the Mars 2020 robotic arm, as well as our uh, high reliability uh, and rugged uh, motor controllers, we created the X-Link uh, system, uh, which uh, it, because it is modular and because it is designed specifically as a, uh, as a space robotic arm, actually almost moves the decimal point in the cost of uh, of robotic arms and, and significantly shortens the development and integration schedule. Um, that system was selected for the Arshnot-1 mission or OSAM-2 uh, managed by Made in Space and we'll be delivering the EDU for that, uh, uh, that mission soon. One of the other uh, investment areas that we see as important to the future of, uh, of, uh, of planetary robotics is that uh, expanding the environmental envelope. So space can get cold, as we all know. Uh, and so we're uh, uh, very pleased to have the opportunity to collaborate with JPL and, and NASA on development of the, uh, the cold arm. Uh, this is based on, so we'll be delivering a, an arm uh, with our Bravo motor controllers, uh, uh, but through uh, an SBIR, we actually showed that this can work uh, down to negative 180 uh, C, which starts to open up a lot of interesting opportunities and sort of uh, reduces the, the requirements for integrating distal or, or uh, 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 elements of the system on the edge, not with radiation or thermal protection uh, systems to sort of, uh, and it, uh, by enabling that expanded environmental uh, envelope, we can really uh, 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 simplify the, uh, the integration effort uh, by basically being able to stick these, uh, the control box anywhere, even if it isn't housed uh, specifically in the arm. We're going to couple that with GPL's bulk metallic glass technology. Uh, GPL has shown that with uh, 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 without a, a wet lube, so not requiring heaters, they can run uh, these gearboxes at extremely cold temperatures um, uh, with, with great effect. Uh, and so when you combine those two, we have a, a powerful tool to enable uh, uh, science instrument deployment uh, and, and simple manipulation tasks, even on a CLIPS class uh, lander. Uh, the plan right now is that sometime in 2023, uh, that this system would be available uh, and be made available uh, for clip, the CLIPS landers. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, we think that there's a, there's a great opportunity to combine our mobility systems uh, with, the, uh, with our X-Link system and then work in the cold uh, technology uh, from the BMG gearbox technology to really enable future systems uh, that uh, are affordable and yet still capable uh, to, uh, uh, to perform tasks, not just instrument deployment or reach out and touch uh, uh, a sample for science, but perhaps even uh, uh, to help with infrastructure uh, or other 
ongoing requirements for uh, for a sustained presence uh, on the moon. Um, so I think I'm about out of time. So I'll just uh, I'll just f finish with uh, a, a couple of thoughts here. Um, uh, one is when you start building robots uh, with limbs that are capable of providing mobility, you start to have the uh, the uh, ability to go out and affect the terrain. And that's useful both from a science perspective, we can get out and we can build, we can dig trenches so that you, uh, our scientists can go and look and, and, and see a sample in context uh, or generate uh, and, and change the terrain if we're going to uh, create um, a sustained presence, whether it's on the, the South Pole of the Moon or elsewhere. Uh, so exploration and science is uh, is going to take us there, but uh, uh, we're looking forward to to enterprise being able to to keep us there. So I th I think I might have gone a, a minute uh, too long. Uh, happy to take questions now or during the panel uh, discussion. So thank you for your uh, for your attention. <laughs>